السلام عليكم الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي ابدا الافلاك والارضين والصلاه والسلام على اشرف الانبياء سيد الكونين امام الحرمين امام القبلتين امام الاتقياء نبي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم فقد قال الله وتبارك وتعالى في القرآن الكريم والفرقان الحميد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولا عصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم الدنيا سجن المؤمن وجنة الكافر صدق الله وصدق رسول ونحن على ذلك من الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين أما بعد It was the day of Arafah in the pilgrimage of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the only hajj that he had ever performed famously known as Hajjatul Wada the farewell pilgrimage because after this, in a short space and time, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he left this world. And on this blessed day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent that wahi and that revelation to his Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Al-yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati wa raditu lakum al-islam madina. That the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, today, al-yawma, Akmaltu lakum dinakum. I have completed for you my religion. And I have perfected and I have completed all my favors upon you. Waraditu lakum al Islam Madina. And I am pleased for Islam to be your deen and Islam to be your religion. Imam Jarir al Tabari, while commenting on this verse of the Holy Quran, he explains. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when this ayat was revealed, then all of the fara'id of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala became complete. No more fard action came after this one ayah. After this ayat was revealed, all the limitations in sharia, it became cemented. All the dictates of those things that were halal, those things that were impermissible haram, those aspects of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he allowed, all of those things have been revealed to the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and explained by the tongue of his Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abdullah bin Salam, he was a Jewish theologian, a rabbi. He had come to the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he looked at the Mubarak face of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said to himself that the we and the face of the Nabi of Allah, this face can never be the face of a liar. And Abdullah bin Salam, he accepted Islam at the hands of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now being a Jewish rabbi, he knew very well all of their laws. And one of the laws that Judaism had was, that you cannot eat the camel's meat. That was impermissible for them. So him being a rabbi, he knew very well that he couldn't have eaten that meat. But now he is Muslim. And now he knows that in Islam and Muslims, they consume the camel's meat. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that. So Abdullah bin Salam, he said to himself, that in honor and respect for the Jewish religion, that I'm not going to eat any camel's meat. But at the same time, I'm not going to consider it as haram. I'm not going to consider it as impermissible. I know very well that my religion that I have adopted, which is Islam, allows it. When Abdullah bin Salam, he gets this inside of his heart and he expresses the statement. Jibreel alayhi salam is sent with wahi and revelation to the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That the Nabi of Allah, you tell the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala, by extension the entire of humanity, 
Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu that all those who believe udukhulu fi silmi kaffa that enter into Islam wholeheartedly, totally. You can't take peace and leave peace. The entire of Islam an individual needs to take. So Islam's the religion of submission. It's the religion whereby when we know the dictates that came from Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Udu, hold on to it, grasp with, make sure that you do amal and you practice upon it. And all the nawahi and all the prohibitions, when an individual learns that those things are impermissible, that individual is to stay away from all of those different things that are there. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs in the Quran that when we become Muslim and when we say we are submitters to Allah, then we are not partial submitters. We are supposed to be individuals and people who totally submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what being a Muslim is all about. It's all about submission before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now when we look at Hajj, and we look at this act of ibadat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's such an amal that can only be performed on certain days of the year in a certain place. Time is extremely important in a certain way. In any other time of the entire year, if an individual says that I'm going to Mina, I'm going to Muzdalifa, I'm going to Arafah in order to perform Hajj, then everybody is going to consider this person a mad individual. If any individual says, listen, you see Masjid al-Haram, I understand the excellence of that place, but Masjid al-Nabawi is also excellent. Hence, I'm going to also do Ihram, and I'm also going to walk around. Well, I know if you get a chance to walk around, you might get stick before that. But place is extremely important. Before you do any amal, time is important. And this is what submitting to Allah is all about. When Allah says to do it, how Allah says to do it, what place Allah says to do it, whether we want to do it or not, it's to do it. This is what submitting before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all about. We have just finished Qurbani. And the stories will have been throughout every lecture. I will have lectured in Masajid. That when Ibrahim alayhi salam, he took his wife to Makkah. Now this was extremely, extremely difficult for her. To leave friends. To leave relatives. To leave comfort. To leave food. To be placed in a desolate area. Where there is absolutely nothing. With a baby. And then say, hey, you got to live here now. I'm not even going to stay with you. I'm going to leave you here. Now, this is what submission before Allah is about. And she asked Ibrahim, Ibrahim, are you just going to leave me here? Ibrahim continues walking. He continues walking. She then asks one important question. She then says, is this a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And this was all Ibrahim salam had to say to her that this was a command from Allah and immediately she was ready to submit before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what submitting before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is about that when we know and understand the dictates and the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered us to do that we say, yes, I am ready to do it. Sahiba radiallahu ta'ala was a very young Sahabi. He lived in the then Persia. His father was the governor of one of the cities there. Sahiba radiallahu ta'ala lived in utter luxury. The golden spoons in his mouth, his father's the governor. Then Rome attacked. When the Romans attacked, all those who were tender in age, all of a sudden, one minute ago you were a prince, all of a sudden you're a slave now. 
So Haib enters into slavery. And he is now sold by the Romans. From one individual to another, one individual to another. Until Suhaib finally reaches towards Makkah. As a slave, he is purchased. His master, he sees quite a lot of intelligence in Suhaib. He says to Suhaib, you're an extremely intelligent individual. I see excellence in you. I don't want you to remain as a slave anymore. Rather, you take your freedom and he frees Suhaib. At that same time, information and news is spreading that there is a man in Makkah who is claiming to be a Nabi. Suhaib, he comes to Darul Arqam. He is right at the door of Darul Arqam. Now it's the time of utter persecution as well. Now outside the door of Ar Darul Arqam, that's one world. And when you enter inside, the Nabi of Allah is there. The things that he is saying is taking them out of this world. He's talking about Jannah. He's talking about Jahannam. He's talking about a totally different world altogether. So Haib enters. He accepts Islam at the hand of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He stays with the Nabi of Allah in Makkah through thick and thin. So Haib radiallahu ta'ala and the time comes. The big jamaat from Medina came to Makkah for Hajj. They met the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam just before Hajj. They put their hands in the hand of the Nabi and say, O oh, Nabi of Allah, we be a witness that you are the Nabi of Allah. That, O oh, Nabi of Allah, do not stay in Makkah with all of this persecution. Why don't you come to Medina? Bring, come everybody to Medina. We'll entertain you in Medina. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he hears them. After they perform Hajj, they left and they dispersed and they went. They had now returned towards Medina. In the month of Muharram, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he gives the first command to the Sahaba. That, oh Sahaba, it's time for you to leave every single thing in Makkah now. And you need to sneak out of Makkah and head towards Medina. You need to do it in such a way that the Quraysh would know that you have left Makkah and journeyed towards Medina in secrecy. I want you to leave. Like that, the Sahaba of the Allah Ta'ala starts to leave and they start to leave and they start to leave. On the 27th of Safar, Abu Jahal, the other Quraysh chieftains, they noticed the Muslims leaving Makkah and heading to Medina. They now had a royal discussion that if we don't do something with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then eventually Islam will spread and we are going to lose every single thing. So they had major discussion, emergency meeting. Everybody is there. One old man walks in. They ask him, who are you? He said, I am one sheikh from Najd. That I come to hear this discussion. And I would also like to contribute as well. The discussion goes on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Holy Quran that one of their plans was let us imprison the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This old man, he said, listen, if you imprison the Nabi of Allah, then his sahaba will find a way to break him free and as such, that will not help the situation in any way. Therefore, that's not a good suggestion. Others said, Li yukhrijuk. Why don't we expel him? Why don't we send him out of Makkah? Abu Jahl says, The tongue of the Nabi of Allah is very captivating. If he were to go to any other land, then people will also accept Islam. Hence, we understand that the problem was not with the Nabi. The problem was with Islam. Muhammad wasn't the issue. Islam was the issue. Hence, if he goes and spread Islam outside, that's what they have a problem with. Hence, the third suggestion was given. Let us kill him then. Let's kill him then. And Abu Jahl gives this. He gives this suggestion. Let's annihilate the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they said to him, how is this going to happen? Abu Jahl says, listen, 
from all the tribes in Makkah, let each individual choose one person from the varying tribes and let each individual come forward and participate in the killing of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If this is done, then the family of the Nabi, they will not have the option to execute and to take a life for a life. Because only Muhammad is killed, which is one. Now you can't kill now because of that one, 10 for instance. Rather, they will be forced to accept the blood money instead. They'll have to take finance. And the finance that will be taken will only be the finance of one man because only one person died. And it's very easy if each tribe contribute a little bit. So therefore, this Najdi Sheikh, he said, yes, this is the solution. Let's execute the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Immediately, Jibreel is sent with wahi to the Nabi. O Nabi of Allah, permission is now granted. You need to leave Makkah now. You need to go across towards Medina. Permission is given now on the 27th of Safar that you need to migrate and you need to leave now. To make the story, the story short, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he puts Ali radiallahu ta'ala to give back everybody their wealth that they used to leave with the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And like that, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he got Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala and Abu Bakr and the Nabi of Allah went to the cave of Thawr. They spent three nights in the cave of Thawr. It's the first of Rabiul Awwal. They left now Makkah. They reached towards Medina on the 10th of Rabiul Awwal. So Haybar radiallahu ta'ala was also informed that, oh, Nabi of Oh, Sahib, you are also going to be one of my companions who is going to travel with me on this Hijrah as well. However, the Quraysh, they held Sahib in lots of discussions. They kept him back. The Nabi of Allah slipped away and went. After much arguing, Sahib finally convinced them to leave. Now the order was given by the Quraysh that if you find Muhammad, or anybody who is leaving Makkah, then get them, they are to be killed. Suhaib is leaving Makkah. The Quraysh are coming for Suhaib now. As they are coming, Suhaib turns around his animal and he says to them, he says, listen, O Quraysh, you know me very well. Before you can draw one arrow, you know very well that I will pull my quiver and arrow will come from it onto my bow. It will be released. And before you can even mount one of your arrows, you very well know that another will be waiting to come to you. That before you can attack me, O Quraysh, you know very well that I will kill every single one of you. He said to them, he says, O Quraysh, that I had long sums of wealth, that I have hid it at such and such a place, that if you all wish, you all can go and take all of my wealth. They agreed. They went and they found the wealth of Suhaib. Now Suhaib journeys and he comes to Medina. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is with the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala. He sees from a distance this young Sahabi is coming. Suhaib is entering. The Nabi of Allah becomes so happy. He says to Suhaib radiallahu ta'ala. He says revelation came from Allah due to what you have done. That from amongst humanity, may yashtari are those who sell and for themselves, trying to gain the rida and the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah has accepted your bargain. That that money that you left in Makkah in exchange for your coming to Medina, that Allah puts it in the Quran to be read from now until Qiyamah. That when the orders were given by them, they were ready to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I was so beloved to the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that whenever any challenge came to Islam, Suhaib is always there and is always ready. Whether it's to come in front, whether it's to go behind, he lives until the Khilafat of Umar radiallahu ta'ala. Umar radiallahu ta'ala is stabbed. He calls the Sahaba and he tells them, that for the remaining days, 
until you all choose a Khalifa, Suhaib is to lead all the Salat until you choose a Khalifa. So Suhaib radiallahu ta'ala, is submitting to Allah despite having to give up every single thing because the rida and the pleasure of Allah was the greatest thing to the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala. They understood that if it is we were to be obedient to Allah, we were to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we will get every single thing will open up to us. The Jannah and the Paradise is going to be ours. Hence you have many incidents where the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala before they died, Allah split the heavens and showed them even Jannah and Paradise right here in this world. Now Allah says in the Holy Quran, telling Abdullah bin Salam, and by extension, every single ummati of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that enter into Islam, not partially, totally, a full submission. That it's called Islam, it's not called my Islam. That what suits me, that's all I'm going to do. That what's good, what's comfortable, what it is I think, that's what I'm going to do. Allah never said that's what you have to do. Allah said, I want submission. Submission is what's called Islam. When a person submits totally to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether they like it or not, they do what they have to do as a Muslim before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In many of the hadith of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that you will often hear, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will see statements like, Al-Muslimu man salim al-Muslimuna min lisanihi wa yadi. The believer, but whoever is translated will never translate it as the believer. They will always say the perfect believer. That kamil and complete believer is that one who, and they explain it thereafter. It's never just the believer. It's the perfect believer. The complete believer. The aim of Sharia is to make us into perfect believers. So how then do we become Kamil? How then do we become perfect? How then do we become complete believers so that we can live our lives in total submission before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah might explain that our entire Sharia is broken up into five categories and five sections. And if we work on those five areas, then we will be practicing on complete Sharia. And as such, then we will be a Kamil complete believer. The first of them, Allah may explain, is that our Aqaid and our beliefs, they must be correct. For good deeds are only accepted when it is beliefs are correct. You don't get entrance into another country. If it is, you don't have the proper documentation. For some, you need visas. If you don't have your visas, hence you can't enter into those lands. To enter into Jannah, you also need a visa. You also need to have documents to be in order. And what's those documents and those initial documents? So that initial documents is correct beliefs. As when Jibreel alayhi salam came to the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is asked by Jibreel. That oh Jibreel. Jibreel asked the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That oh Nabi of Allah. Then what is this iman thing all about? Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He responds to Jibreel. He says, An tu'mina billah is that you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first part of us moving forward, of gaining that akhirah, it's to recognize the jalal of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now in the Holy Quran, Allah says about himself, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Allah didn't just say to believe that there is no deity except Allah. 
Allah says, learn how there is no deity except Allah. That's why throughout Quran, Allah says, you look at my sky. You look at what I do with this sky. That I will change it into night and day. That I will have those floating clouds. Clouds that exist in different layers of the atmosphere. Fulfilling different purposes. The wind is there. All of those varying things. That haven't you seen my perfection as yet? Haven't you seen my excellence as yet? That look how I brought from the daylight into night. And I make this night transform and become daylight. Haven't you seen all of those things? Haven't you seen how I bring forward the rain and how the crops grow from the ground? Haven't you noticed all of those things? Fa'alam, then learn how there is no deity except me. For there is absolutely no deity, no being, no power that can create a single one of them except me. Fa'alam, know very well. When the Quraysh came to the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they said, O Nabi of Allah, Inform and tell us about inform and tell us about the lineage of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For when we live in this world, everybody has parents. Parents have parents. Like that, even animals as well. There are some people, they mind certain animals. And they have certificates of lineage for those very animals that are there. Those thoroughbred dogs and horses. All of the variant animals, they have lineage for them. So Muhammad, what's the lineage of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Revelation comes to the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That oh Muhammad, you tell them, Qul, say, who Allah, that he is Allah. What type of Allah? He is Ahad, he is alone. Why did Allah use the word Ahad instead of Wahid? Wahid means one. One is the number before two. Allah didn't use Wahid, use Ahad. When there is Ahad used, there is no number before, there is no number after. One and one only. Say to them, O Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, all he say, who Allah, he is Allah. Who is as Allah? Ahad, he Allah is alone. Allah samad this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is independent. Every single one of us is dependent. Every creation is dependent. The sun cannot exist except that it needs certain things. The earth cannot exist except that it needs certain things. The moon, the waters, nothing is independent in their existence. They need something in order to exist. Allah is the only being who needs absolutely nothing to exist. So Allah is that being. He is independent. He Allah is self-sufficient. He Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He never gave birth. No birth was ever given to him. Refutation against the Christians. In his father and son type of belief. There is nothing like that. And there is absolutely nothing in comparison to this Allah. First thing, aqaids must be correct. Beliefs must be correct. And tu'mina billah is that you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa rusulihi, his messengers. Wa kutubihi, his books you must believe in. Wa malaikatihi, you need to believe in the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa tu'mina, and that you believe khairihi wa sharrihi min Allah. That good and bad is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now if we understand that good and bad is from Allah, that Allah chooses every single scenario. Now Allah chooses every single condition. What we might see as bad might actually be in our favor. And what sometimes might be really pleasurable and good, that might actually be very, be very, very adverse and very, very bad. So that when we see conditions, that's why the Muslim says, Alhamdulillah ala kulli hal. It doesn't matter the scenario. Allah chose this scenario. This scenario came about because of Allah. Thank Allah for that scenario that's there. 
Hence, beliefs, they must be correct. Second, ibadat. Throughout Quran, Allah informs mu'minun that it's not just to believe. Allah says, wal asr, by time, innal insana lafi khusr, humanity is in a state of loss. Illa alladheena amanu, iman, must believe properly first. After Iman, you got to do Amal salihat You got to do righteous, pious deeds. What's those righteous, pious deeds? Well, I'm going to explain. They are the establishment of Salat. Look at how much time in Quran Allah talks about Salat. Allah didn't say, Sallu, pray. Allah say, Wa iqam is Salat. Establish Salat. If a man stands up outside, and he's selling something and he says, I am an establishment. What will you do? And you're going to smile and you're going to laugh a little bit. The one guy is standing outside. That's not an establishment. An establishment has buildings, procedures, process, has all of those things meshed together. That's what an establishment is. So when Allah says establish salat, it's not just to just stand and just do something. Establishing of Salat has prerequisites. Now Allah talks about the establishment of Salat in the plural form. Well, hence, it's not an individual responsibility alone. It's everybody needs to come together in order to fulfill this command of establishing Salat. Now when everybody comes together, now Salat will be considered as established now. Now Allah's promise is, that if it is we were to establish salat, inna salat tanha anil fahsha wal munkar. That this salat will prevent from immorality and iniquity. That when people collectively were to come and perform salat, then Allah will collectively cause individuals to give up all their sinful treats. Now, when a handful of people alone is coming for salat, then what type of major change will we ever expect to see from Salat? And that change is only going to be in a few people, in a few homes. But where are we going to see the societal promises that the Quran gives when we ourselves are not fulfilling it? Wa ita is zakat. You look through the pages of Quran. Whenever Allah talks about Salat, He talks about the payment of zakat as well has so much of societal excellence, whereby it is to make individuals and people who are non-contributors to the system of zakat, contributors to the system. But that's not going to happen as well, unless collectively it happens. So Allah commands it in the Holy Quran in a plural form as well. The fasting in Ramadan, the hajj that is there. There's hardly any Muslim who doesn't know that he needs to do these varying things. Hence, ibadat is extremely, extremely important. How important it is, ibadat. Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, at the age of seven, start commanding your children to perform salat. And at the age of ten, then you can even punish them for the non-performance of salat. So important is the performance of salat. Now it comes in the riwayats of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That when a husband gets up for tahajjud, then take some water and sprinkle it on the face of the wife so that she will also get up. And the opposite is also mentioned. You think about it. If the family is not even upon five times salat, then if you were to ever throw water on a fellow family member to wake them up, then they will not get up happily wanting to go on that musalla. Then that's going to be an argument and a fight that's there. Only when vision is an akhirat, only when we understand dictates of sharia, then the doing of that person is going to be very, very happy now. Alhamdulillah. My spouse woke me up for salat now, for tahajjud now. Otherwise, it's going to be so much of turmoil. So much of problems actually going to come about. So ibadat, the second thing. In the five different dimensions that are there with regards to the perfect Muslim that is there. The third, it's our mu'amalat. 
our business dealings that are there. Now, this is a major, huge scope of Islam where every single individual has to do from the little kid that goes to school, he also, she also goes to the shop to buy something. They are also in commerce to the oldest individual. Everybody is doing some form of business. Now, Allah says in the Holy Quran, at the very beginning, we heard the Qira'a, that Alif Lam mean, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِي That this is the Quran and the book in which there is no doubt. This book has the hidayat and the guidance for those who are God-fearing. Now after Allah introduces this, now Allah goes to explain who are the God-fearing. They are those. يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ First, they believe in the unseen. Allah says as a Muslim, your mind is different from the mind of everybody else. The whole world only looks at physical things, things that are tangible. Oh, Muslim, you got to believe in things that you can't even see. You have never seen Jibreel, but my Nabi told you about Jibreel, you've got to believe in Jibreel. You have never ever seen the Torah, the Zabur, you've got to believe in it. You have never seen this man called Muhammad, you've got to believe in him. Hence, our minds are channeled and trained that we have to look at every single thing through the lens of wahi and revelation. That every single thing that we do, it's all to be channeled firstly, true revelation that is there. Yu'minuna bil ghaib. After that, establishment of salat. Come and this explain that that's really mean the doing of amal salihat. And the greatest amal salih that is there is the, pre, the performance of salat, hence offer salat. And the third, That don't think that is Islam thing, this taqwa thing is only about salat and reading Quran. No, it's also about how we earn our livelihood and how it's also spent as well. That's also part of taqwa. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, on the day of judgment, the feet of the children of Adam will not move one inch, will not be able to move at all until they answer a few questions. From amongst those questions on the day of judgment, where Allah will ask directly to the different slaves, where did you earn your wealth and how did you spend it? Where did you earn your wealth and how did you spend it? Now we think sometimes, that as long as a person tells us that there is no interest in it, automatically it becomes permissible. Well, if the law was so easy, the largest chapter possibly in Bukhari Sharif would have never been Kitabul Buyu. If the law was only that one rule, then the largest chapter, or possibly the largest chapter, will never have been the chapter of commerce, the chapter dealing with business transactions. Hence, there is a lot more to it. This is just one of the many aspects that make something impermissible. Now, we have been doing it for such lengthy periods in time. And we had one discussion who found out that is my transactions that I am doing, are they permissible or are they impermissible? The things that I am buying, the way that I am selling, the manner of the contracts that I am doing, are they in accordance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Tirmizi Sharif, Rifai says, my father mentioned that his father said, one day we came out with the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to the musalla to offer salat. At that time, the tujjar and the tradesmen were involved in their transactions. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Ya ma'ashara tujjar, O gathering of merchants, istaja'abu, listen well to me. Hadith of Dharmizi says, they raised their eyesight and they started to look at the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Ya ma'ashar tujjar, that are gathering of merchants. Certainly, the merchants will rise on the day of judgment as fujjar, as transgressors before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Why is the Nabi of Allah telling them that? Because a lot of times in business, in transactions, they sometimes get business people lie. People who so many type of fraudulent transactions, so many different types of activities people do when it comes towards business. So the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, O tujjar on omission, yuhsharuna yawm al-qiyamah, o yub'athuna yawm al-qiyamah, they will rise on the day of judgment fujjar as transgressors. Illa man ittaqa, except that one who fears Allah. Fear in Allah in business is also ibadat. So every businessman has an opportunity. If he does it excellently, following the guidelines of Sharia, his entire day that he will open his business, he will do his transaction. You are involved in ibadat to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whole entire day that is there. Illa man ittaqa wa barra. You are righteous. Was sadaqa and you are truthful. Hence, our mu'amalat and our business transactions that are there. The thought, our akhlaq. Hardly ever we speak about it or we study it, but our character as well. When the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Inna min akmalil mu'minina imana. Certainly, the most perfect of believers in regards to their iman is that person who has the most perfect character. Hence, if we want to be the greatest and perfect believer to work on that character that is there, that are we people filled with pride? Do we have jealousy? Do we backbite one another? Do we slander? Do we have hatred? Do we have generosity inside of us? Humility inside of us. Are we humble individuals? Do we have love for Allah? Love for humanity? Are those qualities inside of us? That akhlaq and that character that's there. Look at what Abdullah bin Salam said as soon as he saw the face of the Nabi. He even interact with the Nabi. He just look at the face of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said that that face can never be the face of a liar. That can never ever be the face of a liar at all. The akhlaq of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nabi of Allah is being expelled from Makkah for Islam. But they are calling him Al-Ameen. The most Ameen, the most trustworthy individual they are calling him. They are giving him their wealth in safekeeping. He is being expelled. They want to kill him. He puts Ali radiallahu ta'ala on. You give them back all of their wealth. He cannot, he's a Nabi. He's not going to take their wealth. For them to say, Muhammad stole their wealth, that's not the character of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The akhlaq of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Can we imagine, look at the name given to Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala. He is As-Siddiq. He had the most truthful individual. You know, today people call other individuals nickname horse and dog and the whole entire zoo. They call them by all types of names, the best name you can get. Look at the name of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala and get, he gets what? as siddiq But does Umar radiallahu ta'ala and get, he gets Al-Faruq, Allahu Akbar. Yeah, he gets Al-Faruq. That guy who differentiates between those things that are right and wrong. What does Uthman radiallahu ta'ala and get? He gets Uthman, Dhu Nurain. He was the possessor of the two lights. He married two of the daughters of the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These were the names and the nicknames of these individuals and these people that were there. Because of the akhlaq, the character that they had, they were so phenomenal as individuals. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Holy Quran, when speaking about the character of the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that the character of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Uluqin Azim, is the highest, greatest form of character. Why is he described like that? It didn't matter whether the Nabi of Allah was in public or private, whether the Nabi was with his friends or his enemies, whether the Nabi of Allah was in the masjid or out the masjid, whether the Nabi of Allah was a businessman or non businessman. Whether the Nabi of happy was or angry, whether the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was worried or sad, 
it made no difference to the akhlaq of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Today our akhlaq changes just like how the wind and the weather changes. That depending on who we are with, that's our behavior. If it is we are with friends or in the public domain, akhlaq's different. Private, totally different. One of my teachers used to say, we powder ourselves with this faqir that we are so great as a Muslim. But ask those in our private circles how we are in reality and they will paint a totally different picture. Totally different who we are as individuals. The akhlaq and the character that we actually have. And the last dimension that is there is husnul mu'asharat, is excellent social dealing. Now, Islam is rich with how to deal with each other socially. We will study entire courses on the etiquettes and how to deal with parents. How will parents deal with children? Etiquette with regards to husband and wife, with regards to children, how to give salam, how to treat neighbors, how to do so many different things, how to treat guests, how to be as a host. Every single thing that is there, so much Islam is rich with it. Now, these are the five dimensions. That when a person brings these five into their lives, now they are practicing on what is called Sharia. So today we restrict Sharia to only a few things. So if a person prays Salat and maybe wear Jubba, this person is considered the greatest individual connected to Sharia. You're not looking at so many other aspects connected to Islam. But when those five are there, now this person is considered to be an individual who is upon Sharia. And you ask what the Nabi of Allah is telling the Muslims, Al-Muslimu, you be the perfect believer. Allah is saying, Udukhulu fissilmi kafa, enter into Islam perfectly. So how then do we get all of these varying qualities inside of us so that we can live and our focus in our lives can only be on Islam and as a Muslim the very first we got to learn we got to study the first revelation Iqra second revelation Noon wal qalami wa ma yasturun education we got to learn if we don't learn about the dictates of our religion, therefore we'll just be guessing. We'll just be thinking we are doing the right thing and we are not doing the right thing at all. How many individuals think they are healthy? Until they go to their doctors and they find out that I have this sickness, I have this disease. So much so that people, they don't even like to go and take a blood test. They don't even like to go to take that first sugar test to know if it is they have diabetes or not. Are we going to just live in ignorance while it is the diseases that is going to eat us? I understand very well that whenever any one of these five are not being fulfilled, then to some degree we are in the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hence to avail and to learn well about Islam and the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When it is we learn, as the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Man salaka tariqan, that whosoever traverses a path, yaltamisu fihi ilman, in search of ilman, in search of knowledge, sahalallahu lahu tariqan ilal jannah, then Allah makes the pathways to jannah easy. How the pathways become easy? Because now you know what to do and what not to do. You know in the difficult times what the Sharia say to do and what Sharia says not to do. And to have your connection with righteous, pious, knowledgeable ulama as well. To guide you along the way so that we ensure that our lives are being lived in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So ilm extremely, extremely important. Look at the entire Quran. Nabi of Allah is not asked to make dua for anything except ilm and knowledge. He is ordered, O Nabi of Allah, say, Rabbi Zidini ilma. O Muhammad, you got to say, Rabbi Zidini ilma. 
โอ้ไม่ Lord increase me in ilm increase me in knowledge now how much did the Nabi of Allah say how much is in this Quran how much beauty and excellence of Islam we have no idea about when we start to learn then we'll see the beauty that Islam actually has in every single aspect of life today we study so much academia that we will hear something Islamic now and then we will say oh you know I study that same thing that the Imam talk about you know I learned that same thing that an individual spoke about I know an individual he has his degrees in teaching and after he studied the hadith of the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he then said that every concept that we learn whether it was to student center learning whether it was to use props whether it was to do whatever he said we just have fanciful names for every single thing that's found in the hadith of the rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam look at how much time we spend in mastering sciences connected to this world just to simply earn a living and many a times we will get so much all of excellences yet still we don't even do that dream job that is there and see how much time again we spend when it comes towards islam and the learning of deen you know everybody says today we got to be balanced well you do your maths and you tell me how balanced you are when from three years of age was kindergarten then you went seven years of primary school then you went five years of o levels then you went to do your a levels and you went to do your degree is that equal to sunday morning maktab where's the balance that you're speaking about all you learn is just how to read quran that's all and you feel you've reached excellence and greatness look at the sciences that are there you learn how to find facts you haven't even found as yet what does ghayril maghdubi alayhim wala dhalin you've learned to find things so many different things that are there where's the balance that's there when it comes to ilm and it comes to learning about allah learning about the deen of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala learning about the sharia of islam and the excellence to see what it actually has where's the balance that's there second we need to also have determination as well that there are many naysayers today many people who are distractors of people progressing and wanting to practice their deen there are so many naysayers people on so many groups what it's on the twitters and the facebooks or the whatsapp groups that are there everybody is given his own inter interpretation of islam and deen and they are not encouraging anybody to practice then all of that negativity that is actually there are we going to say no to the naysayers and say i want allah instead that i want allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but let me explain that there is nothing more beloved to a mother than to always hug her child she will always want to just hug and just to hug that kid over there but despite that she will work diligently to get this child to walk and she will see this child struggle with that one step and the two step that is there and as he is about to fall will run and grab sometimes even allowing him to fall as well to know it's not too hard you can get up and you can even try again despite wanting the hug all the time knowing very well this is not going to be very beneficial for the child if i don't teach him this the muscle is not going to develop he's not going to learn that skill and that ability how to run and she needs to give up a little bit in order for that child to become great when to become excellent the determination's got to be there in order for an individual to go forward as well we live in times of extreme negativities negativities come sometimes even from muslims from the media from friends from family members but we got to be determined to stand up and say like sahib and the rest of them that i want to submit to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that i want to start walking i want to start running because when this occurs the nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam says 
When a person makes one hand span towards Allah, then Allah also comes that same amount to a person. When a person goes one arm span, then Allah reciprocates. And when a person starts to walk, then Allah starts to run towards this individual. So are we going to start going towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Are we going to have that determination? Now people, you're in the pandemic time. Everybody wants to lose weight. So they came out with all these new apps now. We'll walk 10,000 footsteps to lose weight. So everybody has those apps on their phones now. And every minute you'll see them in the corridors. Outside the masjid, they're walking. Everybody is making footsteps to lose the weight. Now we're going to start making footsteps towards Allah. But they're going to get that determination and that one, that zealousness that's there to stand for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to have that excellent and good company and to not ever worry about the naysayers at all. Thirdly, nothing we can do by ourselves. To make a lot of dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says that after salat to say, Allahumma, oh Allah, a'inni ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. That, oh Allah, help me. Help me. I can't do it alone. A'inni ala dhikrika. Help me to remember you. Help me to be grateful to you. And help me to do the perfect ibadats that are there. Help me. I can't do it all by myself. I need that help that is there. And in Surah Al-Asr of the Holy Quran, Allah gives two instructions. وَتَوَاسَوْ بِالْحَقِّ That with tact, with wisdom, to also help each other as well. To be as an encouragement towards other individuals and people. That sometimes people are going through very difficult times. How can we also motivate our friends and our relatives, our colleagues that are there to also become obedient to Allah? But at the same time, change doesn't happen overnight. You need to be a little bit patient as well. That our development didn't happen overnight. Similarly, the development of those around will not happen overnight as well. But there are some who they can stop anything cool turkey. There are smokers, them can get up tomorrow and nothing is going to be wrong with them. They are just so good. They can give up whatever it is and many have. But then there are some who will have to give it up little by little, little by little as well. To be patient, to be tactful, to be smart, with wisdom. And like that, to help each other go forward that is there. To help each other go and motivate each other to go forward. You know, some of our lama, they explain that you'll always find the imams and the varying people that they will always entertain the troubles of everybody. They'll always ask everybody else how they are going. But hardly ever will you hear the imams or the people who are in charge ever tell you about their problems. Don't you think they aren't humans as well? You think they are not going through all different things as well. But they carry on with that brave face that is there. Despite whatever it is to sort out all the issues of everybody else. While secretly sorting out their own issues as well. So that sabr and that patience and that understanding must also be there for every individual and every person. So that we can have a focus in life on Islam, whereby every single aspect of our life, we look at it through the lens of wahi and the lens of revelation. That whatever fear we might have been in, that we start to not look at it as an independent science anymore, but we look at it through the lens of what Allah and the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam told us, so that we make every single aspect of our lives into an ibadah. So to work on our aqaid and our beliefs. To work hard and diligently on our ibadats that are there. To work on our mu'amalat, to learn about business practices. To work on our akhlaq and to work diligently and hard as well on our husnul mu'asharat, our dealings that we have with individuals and people. And this sums up 
our every single day of our lives. And if we have this as our focus, then we will be individuals who are living a very focused, diligent life. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, Ya ayyatuhan nafsul mutma'inna. That all oh, that soul that has reached that state of itminan, that reads that stage whereby they are obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says to them, Irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan marudiyya. Return to me in what state? In a state that you are pleased with me and I am also pleased with you. For if we return like that, then Allah says on the day of judgment, what will my royal order be? Fadkhuli fi ibadi. Enter with my slaves. Where to enter? Enter in my jannah and enter into my paradise. May Allah forgive me, may Allah forgive you. For every single sin that we have committed, the big ones and the small ones, the minor ones and the major ones, the public ones and the private ones. May Allah grant us the tawfiq, that we bring all the qualities of excellence into our lives. May Allah grant us that ability to rid ourselves of all of those low, despicable qualities as well. May Allah grant us that ability to live as true Muslims, submitting unto him. May the day that we return to Allah be the best day of our lives. May Allah always grant us environments that we are always able to practice our deen excellently. May Allah make the people around us, our family members and friends and colleagues, our work environments, always environments favorable for the practicing of deen and Islam. May Allah unite our hearts in this world, unite us on the day of judgment, and unite us with the Habib Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa akhir dawana alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.